Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected.
436. horrendous thing that happened to Jesus at his death was none of those pains, none of those insults, but it was the fact that this pure and holy Son of the living God had his, all the sins of all the world placed on his person because of us. So 
as we come to the table this morning, we're reminded in these two elements. It's a convenient thing. It was a part of the Passover service, so we utilized the emblems that he had. Because we take step one. And believe me, I have taken inadvertently taken both layers off at once and I had a mess. <laughs> <laughs> At that Passover meal, there was bread, of course, part of, the, part of the ritual. Jesus had a habit of utilizing symbols to convey a truth. As he tore it, I could almost see him doing it, knowing how they made the loaf. Over. See Jewish loaves, and they're folded over. I can see him tearing off chunks of the loaf. Passing it to his disciples. And then in the process he says, Take it. This is my body, which is broken for you, speaking prophetically. Tacitly he was saying, My body is going to be broken. Thank you, Lord. In the same manner, we took the cup, another element in the Passover service. And he said something very elemental to our salvation. And this cup represents my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins for many. Can you say we're among the many? We are. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> In relation to the Passover celebration, I'm referring to the night that the death angel went over Egypt. And wherever the blood was seen on the doorpost and on the lintels of all the doors of those believers in those buildings, the angel passed over them and didn't slay the firstborn. And herein is our protection. When God comes to judge sin, He sees the son of His, the blood of His Son on our hearts. He has to pass over and say, I do. Really part of me hardly know what to say. The praise of you is in our hearts. to express our gratitude to you for what you have done on our behalf. We had no one among us that could be sacrificed 
pay the penalty for sin. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to be starting at verse 9 and going through verse 21. I don't know about how many others, but one of my favorite verses is found in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brothers, in light of God's testimony, to live your life, to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Amen. And that is your pleasing and acceptable worship. We are not talking about that verse this morning, though. Okay? However, we are talking about what happens later in that verse, which helps to define a little bit of how it is that we are to live our lives as living sacrifices. And how many know being a sacrifice ain't easy? How many like laying on an altar? <laughs> you know? And you know, and all of what that represents. Uh, being able to lay our own lives down, letting him live his life through us. We are crucified with Christ, yet no longer I will live a life. Christ living in you. And that is what we are as believers, what we should be striving for. Amen? Amen. Amen. However, we don't always quite hit the mark, do we? Because we are human. So let's pick up Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9 through 20. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless, and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, 
but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. So he starts by telling us that we are to what there? Love. Let love be without affection. Abhor what is evil, think what's good. And then he ends with that same concept. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How do we do that? Everything in between. Let's pray. Lord God, we seek your face today. We ask you to be in the remainder of our time and speak to our hearts. Help us to hear your voice. And God, would you make the changes within each and every one of us that you need to make to make us look a little more like you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of stuff in this passage. Okay, so if something tells me we aren't going to get through my entire message today. Okay, so Paul, you're my timekeeper. I got you, buddy. Okay, let me know and, uh, what time you have right now. I have 25 after, roughly. Okay, good, so that clock over there is about right. All right, so I want to try to keep it somewhat in tune simply because this ends up going up on the TV station. We're going to try to keep it to an hour as much as we can. So if we have to go into two or three weeks, we'll do that. We don't want to rush it. Amen? Amen. 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 This will be five minutes left. So. <laughs> so let's take a little bit of a closer look at this. So first, let us understand one thing, because he starts off by telling us what? Let your love be without hypocrisy. So what is hypocrisy? Because we've all heard that word, especially in relation to Christians in church, have we not? How many, I don't know about you, but I've encountered so many people that will say, use that as their argument of why they will not go to church, because the church is full of nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. Oh, I think you guys have heard that too. <laughs> so, I think it's important for us, first of all, to understand what is a hypocrite. Because I think the world has a little bit of a faulty definition. <clears throat> the word hypocrisy, properly translated, actually means to wear the mask. To pretend that you are something that you are not. You're one thing down inside, but what you're letting everybody else see is something totally different. You might look Christian, but down inside, things might be a little questionable. It is to live one Christian standard ourselves while we are holding everybody else to a different standard. Right? That's what the Pharisees did. Look at us. Look how well we keep the law. But yet, many of them didn't. It was all about control. And what they were wanting to do is hold everybody else in Israel under their thumb, right? They're holding everybody else to a different standard they were not willing to live themselves. They would be the first to tell you, thou shalt not kill. But what did they do to our Lord and Savior? Kill them. Now, understand this. We are all broken. I'm broken. The only reason, the reason we are actually in church is for the mere fact that we are broken. Somewhere along the line, God got, reached us where we were and helped us realize we can't do this on our own. We need Him. We need His love. Amen. We need His grace. And guess what? When you become a Christian, you still need Him. <laughs> but if we I didn't need Him, I wouldn't be here. Right. We have a sin nature, even once you come to know Christ. Understand, we will mess up. That's why we need God's grace and His mercy. Anybody mess up this week? Do not raise your hand. Because we know, you, we know all of us would be that. Self-included. But let us make this point very, very clear. Just because a person is not perfect does not mean the human is a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Just because we don't have it all together does not make you a hypocrite. I don't know about you, but when I read my Bible, I, I'm glad that God wrote the Bible before I existed. Ah. Because have you ever noticed that even the righteous people, God aired everything? 
not just the good stuff they did, but also the bad stuff they did. And I remember I told people for him released a song a number of years ago. I want to be a man that you would write about. No, uh, uh, you know, not me, because I know I have messed up, and there's some stuff I don't want people to know. How about you? Okay. And we do what we can to hide that sometimes, but no, we can hide nothing from God. Right. You are not perfect. I am not perfect, nor will we ever be until we are with Him. So, everybody is not perfect. So if you're going to say that's the definition of a hypocrite, then yeah, I guess I am not. But that's not what a hypocrite is. What makes the person a hypocrite is trying to make people think that you're perfect when you're not. But yet, God wants us to strive to be more and more like Him. I want to be more and more like him. I hope that today I look a little bit more like him than I did yesterday. And a month from now, a little bit more than I did now. How about you? When we know what we should do and don't do it, but rather look for justifications as to why we are exempt from doing it, is the fuel for a hypocritical lifestyle. Is the very thing that will label us that way. And guess what? It's not man that labels you a hypocrite. It is God who has that right. Because only he knows the heart of man. That's why he was able to look at the Pharisees and call them hypocrites. Because he knew their heart. When we consider hypocrisy, it's really hard to not look at that and understand that it is best seen in how we relate to other people. And Paul addresses that right here in this passage. Aren't you glad you came this morning? I think that's a nice, warm, fluffy thing. Okay. <laughs> so let's take a little bit of a breather. Let's talk about somebody else for a change, okay? Let's talk about the Romans. Let's talk about the Roman church, because that's who Paul was writing this to, was he not? So what do we know about Rome that would prompt him to say some of the things that he said here? Well, first of all, understand the emperors of Rome and at times the governors believed themselves to be gods. They were a polytheistic society. And they actually placed themselves on the same level as uh, gods. Not God, because they believed in many more than one. They were just one of many. The gods, not the Christian <coughs> God, were believed to be the reason for Rome's success and their prosperity. Christians, however, worshipped a different god and only one god. And that was seen unfair, unfavorably by Rome at large. The real reason being this, because in addition to that, Christians were preaching of this God being a new king. And it seemed a bit revolutionary, especially when the rulers were considered to be gods. So to say there's only one God says, you are not what you claim to be. So it stepped on some toes. And if there was an attack, Upon Rome, or there was a bad harvest, anything threatening Rome's success, it was placed on who do you think? The Christians. The Christians were the brunt of a lot of scapegoating. Another thing that we have to understand about Rome is that Roman citizens believed in the idea that man was basically three things. You were a citizen, a soldier, and a farmer pretty much in that order. Now, in order to be a proper citizen of Rome, one must also exemplify the other aspects of soldier and farmer. Christians of day were increasingly reluctant to serve in the imperial army for various reasons, some of which we can identify in scripture. And that obviously created even more distrust of them amongst the people. As far as the value systems, the value systems of Rome could be boiled down to four basic ideas. It was this concept of dignity, faithfulness, respect, and status. The way that they lived their lives was always targeted towards those things. Dignity, or what? Self-exaltation, pride, right? Faithfulness was considered important, which carried with it the sense of devotion and duty but also respect and status was huge. Now some of those are just normal sin nature qualities, aren't they? Pride, wanting status, wanting that prestige, 
So there's some of these things that we can see we will naturally gravitate to as well. But these were big issues in, the, in Rome at the time. And in the Roman church, there were some issues. There's a tendency to live a little hypocritically because there's this aspect, and maybe the hypocr hypocrisy was on the other end because what was happening was that they were being asked to uh, denounce their God. They weren't necessarily always being murdered because of their faith. The way out was to simply denounce your God and accept ours. Offer sacrifices to ours and denounce yours. But the Christians weren't willing to do that, which would ultimately lead to many of them dying. But had they simply done that, they would have been overlooked. So in some ways, maybe they hit their Christianity a little bit. And what Paul is doing here is he's encouraging them to live their Christianity. Live it out, live it out boldly. Yeah, it's going to identify you as a Christian. It might not go well for you because of that. But live the way God wants you to live. The Pharisees tried to make themselves look like something they weren't. A lot of the Roman church tried to do just the reverse. They were wearing a different mask, one trying to fit in. How many times do we see that in our own society? Where we see a lot of Christians just trying to fit in with what it is that the world will accept and not muddy the waters not upset the apple cart. But God says, through Paul here, I want you to live a life that is free from hypocrisy. So how do we do that? Well, starting at verse 9, we see that he says, abhor from what is evil and cling to what is good. A pretty blanket statement. He's going to go now into much more detail into these things of how that looks. But he's saying, if you want to be free from hypocrisy, you can all boil down to this. Abhor evil, cling to the good. What does that mean? Well, in, so you're going to get a lot of Greek lessons. I'm not going to bore you with the actual Greek words. But I want us to really get a good handle on what he is saying. Because how many know our English words don't translate? Greek words do not translate well into English. Right. There's usually things that are much deeper in them. And so when we think of abhor, what do you think of? Hate. Hate, loathing, right? But it's even greater than that. Because some translations will simply say that hate which is evil. Well, you know what? Oh, I wouldn't do that. There's, I hate turnips. <laughs> you know? I mean. there, there, there are things that we hate, but this word abhor is much deeper. It's to actually be repulsed by. And that repulsion creates a desire within you to avoid that thing. A little bit more than just hate. It's it literally, it's like if I get that taste in my mouth, it is so upsetting, it almost creates this attitude of wanting to vomit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Does sin make you feel that way? Mm -hmm. See, now here's the problem. I think sometimes that sin makes us feel that way when we see it in somebody else. <laughs> we see somebody else living in sin, and because the Holy Spirit's in us, it really, it does, it creates a distaste in us. And sometimes we can come across as unloving that to those people. But yet, when it comes to our own sin, we try to make an excuse for it. Hmm. We expect others to live by a different standard than we ourselves. Definition of a hypocrite. Right? Abhor. Actually hate that evil stuff so much. And I'm talking your evil stuff, not your brother's. Hate the stuff within you so much it actually creates a repulsion that you want to get free from it. But notice he doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just say hypocrisy is to abhor what's evil. He then says, and now cling to what's good very important piece because we have this thing called the sin nature. What's going to happen the minute we avoid something and don't replace it with something else? We're simply going to go back to that thing. We're going to go right back to what it is that we are used to to fill that place that we left vacant. So he's saying you need to turn away from the stuff that's evil, get so bothered by your sin that it actually creates a desire to avoid it. And then, when that happens, cling to what's good. 
some translations use the word hmm. Now, where do we hear that word in Scripture? Book of Genesis. As a man leaves his father and cleaves to his wife. There's an abandonment of the one thing and a cleaving to something that I am not going to let go of. I am going to hold on to it with everything that I've got. Get the distaste and the repulsion towards evil and grab hold of the stuff that's good like you're never going to let go of it. Have that kind of a grip on it. That's the general terminology that he's using here. So that's the first question. Are we at that point? And this really is a checklist. Now, now I would I'd encourage you to kind of maybe bookmark this page in your Bible. And maybe over the next number of weeks, take a look at it and begin to say, hmm, oh, I'm doing great on this, this, group. I'm kind of failing down here. <laughs> you know. But begin to get an idea of how well you are lining up with these things. But that is point number one. Abhor to evil, cling to what's good. Verse number 10 gives us some ideas of how we can kill hypocrisy regarding our brothers. And by brothers, we're not just talking your biological offspring or you know, siblings. We're talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. It says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. Now, how many know that the words are not put in here accidentally? Or to just be redundant? He could have very easily just said here, be affectionate to one another. Just be affectionate. But he doesn't. He says, be kindly affectionate. What does that carry with it? Some translations put it this way, be tenderly affectionate. So you can be affectionate, you can love somebody, but are you tenderly loving? Are, are you handling them as you would your most prized possession? That is kind of what's dealing with. You know, if you were to try to um, hold on to something like a butterfly, right? You know, you can't damage those wings at all. Those wings are very fragile. You can handle that with a lot more care than you would a bird. Right? You might, you can be affected to both, but there's a different level that you've got to be with that butterfly. And it's the same thing with people. We need to be kindly affected. We need to handle our relationships that well. With what kind of love? Brotherly love. That's a comradeship type love. That's phileo. Okay? And in honor, give preference for one another. Why not just say give preference to one another? Why proceed it with in honor? Think about who he's writing to. What was one of their main ideologies? Dignity. Respect. Right? Honor was a big deal. So this, these words are put in here to help them understand. Look, you want to be honorable? You want to bring dignity not just to yourself, but also to the God you serve? The way you're going to do it is by giving preference to one another. See, you want to raise yourself up, but the only way you're going to raise yourself up is by giving preference to one another means what? In eagerness, going exceedingly above the norm. Or in this case, exceedingly below the norm. Because what you're talking about giving preference to one another is to what? Come under and serve people. To come under and, and show God's love and God's life to people. To see them become everything God intends for them to be. You want to have honor? The only way you're going to get honor is to come underneath somebody else. The only way you're going to get exalted is to humble yourself before the Almighty God and love those and serve those that he, whom He also loves and serves. So, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. That also doesn't mean when it's convenient. Right? Sometimes love is inconvenient. If you look at verses 11 and 12, it tells us this, regarding how we are to live unhypocritically when we are in the Lord's service. It says there in verses 11 and 12, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. 
seven different things there. <clears throat> Number seven. I love that. Right? You want to be found faithful? You want to have the kind of life that people can look at and say, yeah, there is a real Christian? Well, one way you're going to do is by not lacking in diligence. And in other words, don't shrink away or be slothful toward your dedication to your Lord. You know, when, when the... And this isn't a come-to-church message, okay? But how many know that there's a lot of people within the body of Christ that no longer go to churches. They no longer hang out with fellow believers. They've kind of shrunk away. And, and, and this isn't to bring condemnation on anyone. But let us be dedicated to one another, however we can do that. Stand ready to expend the effort and energy that's needed to fulfill the task God's given you. That's what it means to not lag in diligence. It's to move forward, again, with effort and energy, enthusiastically standing there. And then he says what? Be fervent in spirit. Well, what does that mean? Literally translated, boil in your spirit. Now, what emotion, when you think about it, do we often refer to as boil? We boil with anger, right? And when we say someone's boiling with anger, what we're usually saying is what? They are literally overtaken by their anger to the point that that passion has now begun to dictate how they live and how they treat others. What God's saying is boil in spirit. Oil in his spirit. Allow his, your desire to want to live for him, so overwhelm you, so overtake you, that you can't help but live out your love for Jesus. If you feel like living the Christian life is just a drudgery and just a duty, pray that God makes you fervent Amen. in spirit. Amen. Ask him to boil you again. Yes, first of all. You know? To bring, to, to ignite that passion. And that might sound weird to some people, but you know, the psalmist prayed that very thing, did, did he not? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. In translation, boil me in my spirit. <laughs> so that what? I begin to follow after you in everything that I do. We cannot live the Christian life no matter how hard we try. We will mess up every single time unless the Spirit does it through us. Amen. My flesh is always going to get in the way. It's only to the extent that I let God do it through me that will make the difference. How fervent are you in spirit? And I'm not saying we don't have dry times. Every one of us will go through a dry spell at one time or another. But what do we do when those times come? Well, God's just not listening to me, so I don't I think I'll stop going to church. Or I'll stop reading my Bible. Or what do, what good does it do to spend all this time in prayer? You know, I don't see him answering anyway. And so we begin to throw in the towel. No. When that happens, do it more. You know, the enemy's doing something trying to frustrate you, probably because he knows it's gonna get you somewhere. And it's somewhere good. Amen. When those things want to rise up and when those discouragement, those frustrations and those arid dry times come, let that become the motivation that pushes you even deeper into those arms. And see what happens. Then what do you say? So don't lag in diligence, be fervent in spirit. What? Serving the Lord. Understanding that your service to Him is your worship to Him. It's not the songs we sing, that's the expression of worship. But to think that music is all that worship is, is missing the boat. Everything that you do for Christ is worship unto Him. Amen. So serve Him. How? The scripture tells us God loves a cheerful heart. That's in everything. And you get to remember that your service is worship. If you don't serve him, you're not worshiping. 
all you're offering is lip service. How many have had kids that do that? They can tell us off, especially when they're little. <laughs> they know they want the chocolate cake that's in the fridge. So they'll do everything that they can to help you understand how much they love you. <laughs> until they get that of that huge chocolate chip cookie you've been stashing somewhere, right? <laughs> but what happens once they get it? Oh. Yeah. I'll forget about mom and dad now until the next time they get something. Well, of course, a lot of Christians running around treat their relationship with God that way. You know, when I need something, I'll go to God and I'll ask Him and I'll offer my worship and I'll offer my praise and and I'll do what I can to stroke God's ego till I get what I want. And then once He meets us where we are and things begin to, to get better, we then forget about it and continue to go our own way until the next crisis comes. Watch out for that. That was not in the note, so whoever that was for, it's from God. <laughs> Don't kill the messenger. <laughs> Amen. Next thing it tells us to do is rejoice in hope. Be joy filled in hope. What the heck does that mean? How, how are you filled? How, how are you filled with joy in hope? I would think hope would bring joy. But here's the thing. What it's really saying is be joy-filled as you look forward with confidence to what's good and beneficial. It's understanding that God knows the plans He has for you. Right? And He that has begun a good work in you is going to carry it on to what? Yeah. Completion. There's the hope. What that tells me is this. I can't mess up so bad God can't fix me. Amen. And I can't mess, mess up anything else so bad God can't fix it. So I'm going to look forward with the confidence, knowing that God said that He's trained, He's trained and equipped me for every good work. And I'm just going to do what I know to do, and yeah, I might stumble, I might not do it the best. God could do it a whole lot better without me. But He'd rather do it with me and have that look quite as good. That's love. <laughs> right? And so it's rejoicing in the hope, knowing that He is going to see us through to the other side. His blessings are just about, just beyond the horizon. Be joyful in that. Especially when you're going through the hard time now. Because remember, He's talking to a church that's being um, frowned upon by the culture that's in there. Not, not feeling a lot of joy in that moment. So He's saying, when you're not having joy here, look to what's ahead and get your joy there. Amen? Amen. And then he says this. Be patient in tribulation. Be patient in tribulation. Grip my teeth and just kind of <laughs> suck it up. Is that kind of what it's getting to? A little bit more than that. To continue to bear up. Continue to endure. Continue to persevere despite the difficulty of the suffering. It's not this idle thought. You know, sometimes we think of patience as kind of being an idle thing. I just kind of got to wait until something happens. And that's not what he's saying here. He's saying that in your tribulation, press on. Mm -hmm. Don't lose sight of what's important. Continue to keep on keeping on. Bear up. Endure what this God has placed before you. Scripture tells us that it is for what lied before him that Christ endured the cross and bore the shame. Right? There's where that rejoicing and hope comes in in helping him get through the here and now. How was he able to take the cross? Because he knew what the reward was on the other side, what the reward was on the other side, which he And it was me. And that's what helped him press on. Same thing with us. Be patient. Continue to endure, knowing that the tribulation will bring about God's perfect and as you're doing that he says continue steadfastly in prayer there is the key to how it is you remain patient in tribulation how you're able to keep enduring you will never be able to endure everything that's coming at you unless you continue steadfastly in prayer when you're going through it and what does that mean? it means to persistently remain devoted to pray let me say that again persistently remain devoted and pray. There is not, it doesn't come in waves. 
right? It's something that's not going to need renewal. It's going to be consistent. Oh, and by the way, it's not just that. It's to persistently remain devoted to praying with intense effort. Don't close. give in. It's like hard times come. Pray harder. Yeah. Right? John Wesley, I think it was, during the Great Revival Movement, when he was questioned about, so tell me about your own walk. You know, your your God's using you incredibly. I mean, you've got so many revival meetings and all this stuff happening. You know, your time is really not your own anymore. Um, so tell me about your prayer life. He's like, I pray twice as much now. Like, how can you pray twice as much when you have half the time? <clears throat> He's like, I can't afford not to. And that has to become our attitude. The understanding that we cannot afford not to pray. We need to keep praying. Understanding that anything that's going to come of any fruition is only going to be only least through the power of prayer. Yeah. God's power in your life comes through the power of prayer. And through His Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. Where are you at today? We've only gotten through verse 12. So we are obviously not going to keep you here to verse 21. Okay? There's a lot of stuff in here, isn't there? Let me ask you, and do not answer out loud. <laughs> Given everything that we just talked about today, if you had to give yourself a grade, where do you stand? Where do you stand? I'm talking to another grade. We're not doing letters. We'll give you numbers. One to a hundred, where do you stand on these concepts? Because if we're not practicing these, we're giving way to a hypocritical lifestyle. Now, am I saying we're going to be perfect? No. But is this our heart? Is this our attitude? Is this our drive? You're going to mess up. You're not going to get any of these perfect. That's what grace is for. But are we able to say, that this week, I'm further ahead in some of these than I was this time last week. Amen. And if not, take it before Christ. Repent. You know, He's faithful and just. He'll forgive you your sin. Cleanse you of all unrighteousness, the Bible says. That even includes after you get saved. Okay? Don't let the devil say, oh, look how bad you messed up. You know? You got like one out of all of these. Every day. <laughs> Don't let that kind of condemnation come out of you. But use this as kind of a little bit of a benchmark. God, how am I doing? Am I looking like you? Because you know what? Jesus got made in all of us. If we want to look like him, we kind of got to get this stuff back. Amen? Amen. Lord God, we thank you this morning for your grace over our lives that, Lord, even in our mess ups, we're still your children. You still look with love upon us and you're not here to condemn but God, if you want to say that today our heart's desire isn't just to live this life because we should as Christians, we want to live this life because we want to please you. Because we want you to understand our gratitude and our heart for you. So Lord, any of these areas that you've spoken to any of us about today, God, would you help us as we leave here to identify how we might be able to do a little bit better this week than we did last week in living this stuff out? So, God, when we come back next week, we'll know we're, just that, we're looking just that much more like Jesus. Would you have your perfect way in us as we come to you? God, we can't do this on our own. It's impossible on our own. But, God, with you, all things are possible. So come, have your way in us today. In Jesus' name, amen.